Good evening, everyone. My name is Benedict Lecca, Executive Director of the Redwood Library in Newport, Rhode Island. And I am uh, presenting tonight's event from the Carpenter Room upstairs. I wanna welcome uh, everyone that is currently viewing and uh, others who might be listening. Uh, and I wanna welcome our esteemed speaker, Professor Joseph Edelman of Framingham State University. Uh, who is going to uh, help us understand uh, the situation with the Postal Service as it is today by way of historical parallels that he knows a lot about uh, regarding the Postal Service in the colonial period. Uh, just a little bit about, uh, first of all, for those of you who may have questions during the talk, during the discussion, uh, or after, uh, we're gonna keep it free flowing. I'm gonna ask uh, Professor Edelman some basic questions about the topic and since he's the expert. And periodically I'll look down at the bottom corner where it says say something nice. So those of you who have questions as we're discussing, feel free to type them in and I uh, will likely pick those up and read them out for, for everyone and have him uh, answer them. Um, Professor Edelman is uh, in the uh, an associate professor in the history of art. Uh, hi, excuse me, uh, in the history department at Framingham State University in Massachusetts. He's a historian of media communication and politics in the Atlantic world, uh, and he recently published his first book, Revolutionary Networks: The Business and Politics of Printing the News, 1763 to 1789. Uh, published by the Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, that is also, of course, where uh, he received his PhD in uh, history. Uh, before that, he was at Harvard University, where he earned his uh, BA in history. Uh, he's also currently working on a comprehensive historical treatment of the post office in America. So. Uh, we're delighted to have him here tonight to talk to us um, about a topic that uh, I can't think of anything more topical at this point, uh, two weeks away from the election. And uh, from what I read every day, uh, it's worrisome, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to get right to it. Um, Joseph, you know, and I, I'm referring really strictly to that important article that you published uh, in 2010 with Oxford University Press. Uh, and uh, I suspect that was probably the germ of your book uh, that was produced uh, a year or so ago. Uh, and the title of it was A Constitutional Conveyance of Intelligence, Public and Private, The Post Office, The Business of Printing and the American Revolution. Now, um, you start uh, and you contextualize that study within the broader construct of the public sphere. And um, as we know, that, that is a, a, one of the dominant interpretive models for the 18th century. And I just thought maybe for our viewers, those of, uh, of the people listening who are not so steeped in this material as you are, what, what, is, what is the public sphere and what, what, why is it important? What does it mean? And uh, how does the post office uh, play into this collective? Because we understand the 18th century always to be the sort of the, uh, the cradle of modernity, you know, rise of newspapers, celebrity culture, the Parisian salon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we could just begin by laying that kind of framework foundation from which we can then uh, refer back to. Sure, uh, and before I launch into an answer, I wanna thank you, Benedict. Uh, for inviting me and Patricia, who I know is off camera for um, both of your work in making this event possible. Um, so the public sphere as a term comes from a German social theorist named Jürgen Habermas. Um, and I am, despite my reputation, going to try not to put everyone to sleep so we won't go too deep into <laughs> all of the, the German social theory. Um, but the basic idea is that um, the public sphere is this space, um, both literal and metaphorical, where people come together to debate about politics and political life that is separate from government, that is separate from 
the state and and that as an entity. Um, so where that comes out in the 18th century, as you say, in Europe um, is in salon culture, um, in taverns, in coffee houses, any place where people gather uh, to talk about and read and debate about politics. Um, and in America, the same thing is happening. There are taverns, there are coffee houses. Um, the role that the post office plays in that is, uh, it too is a physical space where people go to, uh, in the 18th century, you have to go to pick up your mail. Uh, your mail doesn't get delivered to your house. So you, um, you, you have to actually go to a space um, and then you gather, you open your mail while you're there. Um, not infrequently, the postmaster is also the coffee house owner or the owner of the printing shop where the newspaper in town gets published. Um, and so there's this cross pollination of, of, of places and spaces. Um, and the other thing that the post office does is it helps circulate information between towns. So if you're in Newport and you want to know what's going on in Newport, um, you know, you go down to the coffee house or the tavern and you talk to your friends, talk to people you see, and you can find out what's going on in Newport. But if you're interested, if you're a merchant in what's going on in New York or Boston or Philadelphia or Charleston, um, the way you find out about that is through the post office, through personal correspondence, and especially through newspapers, um, which you're right to say that the, the work I did on that article um, was one of several germs. My project was very germy. Um, in terms of thinking about news and its circulation uh, in the, the book project. Uh, but that gets you a start on what the public sphere is. Um, yes. If anyone has more questions um, about exactly that, I can go into more detail, but that at least gets you a start. And, and the post office is really a space for its role in that is especially in circulating and keeping information moving for people to be able to access. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that explanation, uh, Joseph. You know, one of the things that I always mention about the Redwood Library itself in that uh, libraries were novel communal spaces in the 18th century. And uh, the original building, of course, was one of the bigger uh, spaces besides Trinity Church in Newport, Rhode Island in the middle of the 18th century. And ultimately, those are always politically charged. So when you have that body of people getting together and discussing ideas, well, we know what happened here. They probably got into the Redwood Library and they all looked at each other and said, you know what, we're all on the same page. We, we don't like that king in England so much. And then uh, the rest is history. So uh, thank you. And I think that's very important for people to understand because, you know, uh, as I mentioned in the little blurb um, describing this evening's event, um, I myself fell into it. You know, we have this idea that the post office is a sort of inert public service. It's almost in the background. Oh, you get your letter and you're all set. No, and, and it has very serious political implications. Um, now, uh, Joseph, if you wouldn't mind, you know, I think it's very important for people to get a better sense of uh, the postal service in the colonial period. We, you know, I never thought much about this until recently, and I always thought, well, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, is it the, the Pony Express, or how did, how did it circulate exactly? And in this, uh, this important article you, you produced, uh, you talk about the two tracks of postal delivery. There's the, the official, uh, which is the imperial, uh, i.e. The, the, the sort of British dominated from London, uh, and the informal. And so I'm wondering if you might uh, give us a bit more on the, the, the official and the informal and the contrast and some of those alternative pathways that you discuss uh, so well in this article. Sure. Uh, so the formal post office is run by the British government. Um, its origins date back to 1673 when the governors of Massachusetts and New York tried to get uh, a post rider to communicate between New York and Boston. Um, that service um, didn't work very well. Um, there's then a series of steps that in seven, lead in 1710 to Parliament passing a Post Office Act that encompasses formally the British North American colonies as part of the British postal system. Uh, and so there is supposed to be service up and down the Atlantic seaboard. Um, for those of you who live on the East Coast, like in Newport or in New York, if you know of Boston Post Road or um, US Route 1, is essentially the same path that was the literally the post road in the colonial era. And so that ran down from Boston to Providence, 
Um, you know, it then had a track that went down to Newport and a track that stayed along the mainland, um, then along the Southern Connecticut coast to New York City and then onto Philadelphia and, and further south. Um, and that was what you were supposed to use by law. Um, it was the system that Benjamin Franklin was deputy postmaster general overseeing from the 1750s to the 70s. Um, and uh, it had operated by the rules and regulations that were set by parliament. Um, so there were officially designated postmasters, officially designated post riders, a fee schedule for postage for um, how much it costs to send letters or newspapers or things like that. Um, the problem with it is that it was relatively expensive um, to send a letter. It could be an entire week's wages for an average laborer. Uh, so in terms of letter writing, it was something that mostly um, the upper class used. Those were your power users of the postal system. Um, people down into the middle class, there's been some research and actually um, you and I talked earlier about this and the Newport Post Office in particular, um, where down into the middle classes, people would send maybe a letter a year. And so it's used by many people, but the people who are really using it as part of their work as part of their lives are people who are relatively upper class. Um, but people still wanted to communicate. And so they came up with a variety of, of other means. Um, they would, if you had uh, a friend, right, if you lived in Newport and you had a friend traveling to New York, uh, going by ship or by stagecoach, um, you might hand them a letter and ask them to deliver it for you. Um, there were some post riders who would uh, have a separate mailbag uh, that they would take uh, mail on the side for cheaper and they would be able to keep all the profits. Um, and actually the Newport to Providence writer, a guy named Peter Mumford was notorious for this in the 1770s, um, that uh, there was a postal inspector named Hugh Finlay who talked about there are, are two posts in Newport, the Kings and Peter Mumford's, um, that he was, he literally just had two bags. And on one side was the King's official post, which was locked with a key uh, to provide security as per uh, parliamentary act. Uh, and then he, on the other side of, his, of the horse, he had the other bag uh, that he carried mail, um, almost certainly for pure profit, um, that he would he would charge us a, a lower rate. Um, so when, when we're talking about a formal and informal system, um, that's really what we're talking about, is you're supposed to use by law if you're sending mail back and forth. Um, the formal British imperial system um, for a whole host of reasons, largely economic people throughout the colonial period are using all these other means. Um, and then once you get into the imperial crisis in the 1760s and 70s, people start to see any part of British imperial administration as a threat. And so they're specifically trying to avoid it. They're worried about their letters being opened, uh, which for some of them is true, that is happening. They're worried about giving revenue to the British crown. Um, they begin to talk about the post office as a tax um, on colonists. So it becomes uh, an object of, of derision uh, and politically motivates people to try and avoid uh, paying the, the postage fees. Fascinating. Um, so again, uh, it's politically charged. Uh, the the official system allows for um, for censorship and and surveillance, and the informal pathways uh, allow for uh, for the evasion thereof. Uh, so one can equate the rise of the revolutionary movement to these sort of alternative pathways. I mean, is that accurate to say that? Yeah, uh, it certainly uh, plays a key role. Um, they, they are trying to avoid to the extent that they can using the formal British postal system to talk about undermining British authority. Excellent. Now, I, I wanted to just ask you, uh, you know, this is quite granular. I mean, um, letters in the 18th century, you know, I, I was just reading a little article uh, about uh, letter writing in the 18th century in Rhode Island. And one of the things that they mentioned, for example, is how people would have in mind to write a letter to someone. And then, you know, they figured whenever I get to it, I'll write the letter. 
And then somebody would pull up at their door and say, you know, I'm on my way to New York. And they'd be like, oh, I've got to quickly write something so that I can give it to you to move on. Um, letters, you know, I, I've, I've bought a number of 18th century letters on eBay. I've got a whole stack of them. And so um, just maybe if you have any information about the letter itself, uh, how it was folded, uh, you know, how it was marked, the stamps, I mean, the whole kind of the very, the, the mechanics of the actual object circulating. Sure. Um, so in the 18th century, paper is relatively precious. It's um, all made out of rag linen, out of, of cloth. So it's, um, it's more similar to what today we would call resume paper, right? There's linen paper you can get, and it's the fanciest thing you can get now. Um, you go to Staples or wherever. Um, most of our paper now, obviously, is wood pulp, um, which is considerably cheaper to produce and um, also more brittle. But um, with linen paper, what that means is it's uh, because it's relatively precious and expensive, you're trying to be careful with how you use it. Um, so that means a couple of things. Number one, as you hinted, there's no envelopes, um, right? You, you wouldn't waste an entire piece of paper just to wrap another piece of paper. <laughs> um, you leave one side of your letter blank and fold it so that blank side is open um, and you can go look online. There's how to, if you just Google how to, fo how to fold an 18th century letter, um, there's a couple of sites, um, historic sites and things like that, that have guides for exactly which ways you fold it um, to get one side um, facing out. You would usually seal the letter with wax, um, which would also, um, which is a double security measure. It both closes it for the journey um, and especially if you're upper class, you have a personalized seal that you're sealing the letter. And so if the seal has been broken, um, somebody would be able to tell, um, tell that even if it had been resealed with different wax, because it would be a different seal, a different mark. Um, so on the outside, you would, um, address the letter, but it could be, um, you know, if you, if I was writing a letter to you, uh, I would address it to Benedict Lecca Newport. And that would be it because it would go to the Newport post office and then you'd have to come pick it up uh, in, in Newport. Uh, the other trick um, is that postage was paid by the recipient, not by the sender, right? Since, um, since the invention of postage or the advent of postage stamps in the United States in the 1840s, uh, the person sending the letter pays for the stamp, um, pays for the, the postage. But in the 18th century, the person receiving it was responsible for paying the postage. Um, which means that the post office is actually taking a little bit of a risk by carrying your mail because they don't know if you will accept if I send you a letter, they don't know that you will accept it and pay the postage when it gets to Newport. Um, and it's uh, charged by two things. One is by the number of sheets of paper you're using. That's the way the rate structure for a single, a double, a triple. Um, and then by the distance traveled. So the further you're sending something, the more expensive it is and the more pieces of paper. Uh, so people tried very hard to minimize, um, obviously you can't do anything about the distance. New York and Newport are as far away as they're going to be. <laughs> um, but to minimize the number of pieces of paper, um, so people would do things like write letters in several parts, right? They'd start a letter and if they had, um, usually you take a sheet of paper and fold it in half so that you had sort of four pages um, and you could write on up to three of them and have one folded on the outside. If you only filled up one and a half pages, if it wasn't something urgent, um, you might wait and continue writing a couple days later. Um, if you're writing across the Atlantic or something that's going by boat, you do the same thing. You just keep writing until the day the ship is leaving and then you run down to the dock and hand the completed letter uh, off to the ship captain and for their mailbag with however much you've been able to write. Um, and so those travel schedules end up really shaping, uh, shaping the schedule. There is a, a regularized schedule for uh, the post riders riding the road along the coast. Um, spring, summer, and fall, they do a pretty good job of that. In the winter, they sometimes run into difficulties because of the weather, uh, just like now. Um, so that can become an issue. Um, that we can see, since I've done a lot of research in the newspapers, um, that's the other key part of what the post office is doing, which we haven't really gotten into yet. Um, and actually, maybe I'll save that for, for a little further. We can finish up with letters before we, we do newspapers, if you want. Sure. Uh, this, this reminds me, of course, of the account books of uh, Thomas Vernon, who was the uh, Newport 
postmaster from 1745 to 1774, I believe. Uh, and there's a, a great little statement in this article I was reading. Um, he, within a few months, he managed to secure two minor royal offices, one as Newport postmaster and the other as register for the vice admiralty court. These positions afforded Vernon only middling economic rank, but he boosted his social status by becoming an active member of the Redwood Library. So, uh, interesting. Um, and uh, I, I want to go back to Benjamin Franklin just very briefly, since he's such a, a sort of uh, a popular figure that people really can, uh, can know and, and know of. Um, you know, we know he came to Rhode Island in, in 1754. There were the letters exchanged with, uh, I can't remember her name now. And so he, he had this lifelong friend with this woman that he had met in Rhode Island in, in the mid fifties. Um, how does he, you know, you say in your piece at one point, you know, he basically revolutionized the postal system. What did he do exactly? Can you, can you tell us? So he, um, I'll try and keep my, postal biography of Franklin pretty brief, but he was actually involved with the British Imperial Post Office for 37 years. Um, first as the postmaster in Philadelphia where he was living, um, beginning in the late 1730s, and then for 21 years as one of two deputy postmasters general for North America. Uh, so the Brit whole British system has two postmasters general in London. Um, he was then deputy with um, another man um, different person over the 20 years um, overseeing operations in North America. Uh, and so what, what he did as Deputy Postmaster General uh, was really make the post office into a profitable venture. The way it was structured was that the Deputy Postmasters General were paid out of postal receipts, but only if the post office made a profit, which it had never done before the 1750s. <laughs> Um, so he was eager to uh, streamline service. So uh, when he first took over the post, he took a tour of the North American colonies um, with William Hunter, his co-deputy postmaster general. Uh, and that would be when he visited Newport in 1754, um, reviewing offices, reviewing routes, reviewing books, uh, the account books in each of the local post offices, some of which were better kept and some of which were relatively sloppy. Um, you know, trying to, he came up with rather, um, excuse me, he came up with several uh, accounting forms or, or processes for accounting to try and bring postmasters into line with one another in terms of what records they were keeping and making sure that they were reporting quarterly and delivering money. Uh, he tried to improve the route that the post office took uh, and and lay that out more clearly. Um, he gave, um, or not gave, but worked to create favorable rates for newspapers to circulate. Um, so that obviously he was uh, in his start, a newspaper printer, a printer of the Pennsylvania Gazette for 20 years. And so he was very interested in newspapers and that's, um, there was no associated press when newspapers wanted to print news from other places. You needed a copy of a newspaper from another place. Uh, to pick out paragraphs from, and you got those through the post office. Uh, so he helped set up those policies. And by the early 1760s had made the North American post office into a profitable venture. Uh, he also turned it into a patronage machine. Many of the postmasters uh, by the 1760s were people connected to him in, in some way, shape or form. Uh, Vernon predates him, but uh, the postmaster of Boston for a long time was a guy named Tut Hill Hubbard, who was one of his Boston cousins. Um, his son and his nephew each served as a postmaster. Uh, various of the people with whom he was partners in the in printing businesses in various towns and cities served as postmasters in those places. Um, so he made sure that it worked for his friends and family, uh, as well as for himself, as well as for everybody else. But he made the service into something efficient made it into something workable uh, and made it into something that actually brought in revenue uh, enough to pay his own salary. You know, uh, in, in your article, of course, you, you talk about the important role of postmasters and their relationship to printers and how often many times there were one and the same person. 
uh, and that whole, uh, which brings up the whole relationship of, you know, self-interest in relation to the sort of communal public sphere and how that shapes uh, one's political views. You know, they, I, w I was reading uh, one part where uh, you mentioned that uh, Benjamin Franklin's brother, James, was very attentive to to sort of temper his political views because the bulk of the business he received as a printer uh, was from the British government. So he didn't, uh, and yet, of course, the, the, the bulk of your article is, is the, the, the premise is that um, these printers were central figures that not only was it their own self-interest uh, um, and, and, but also, uh, you know, part of a system that they had to negotiate both their self-interest and, and, and their political views and, and sort of dance around. So maybe you can uh, talk about that briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, and this this actually gets to the heart of what the book is about uh, is about printers more broadly and how they they approach their businesses. Um, so, as I said in the article, and as as you just mentioned, um, printers and postmasters were often the same person um, because both of those are functioning as information hubs: the printing office and the post office and uh, newspapers. It is something that uh, printers certainly seek to be active in and, and play an active role in. Um, for most printers during the colonial era, they are the only uh, only printer in a town. Uh, and that's true for James Franklin when he gets to Newport, um, and later true for all the other printers in Newport up to the revolution. Uh, in Boston and New York and Philadelphia, there's more than one, and so the environment is a little different there because there's competition. But most of the time, there's barely enough business around town to support a printer uh, to keep the, the business operating. And so what they do is they make sure they don't anger anybody, uh, right? You wanna be, appear to be politically neutral, whatever your stance actually is. Um, because if you anger half of a town that can barely support you in the first place, you've only got half a business and that just doesn't work. Um, and the other thing that they, they do, and this is another reason why they seek um, appointments as uh, postmasters or a Vernon who was a postmaster sought appointment as a register with the vice admiralty court is you seek imperial appointments, which can get you um, some additional revenue, some additional money for to support your family. Uh, and that also would suggest that you want to be careful at least about angering local officials. Um, so that's largely true in the colonial era. Um, they are still balancing their business interests and their political interests, um, and actually would like to pull in Franklin and anonymity, which is the question that Rich just posed um, here, if I can, and sort of fold it into this discussion. Um, because one of the things that the newspapers uh, do as a practice is that almost all of it is either anonymous, uh, which is to say it's unauthored, there's no author listed on newspaper articles, newspaper paragraphs, or published with a pseudonym. Um, Right, so Franklin has, um, oh dear, silence do good. Um, there's the Pennsylvania farmer. There's right, there's all these these famous um, Publius who writes the Federalist and is actually Madison, Hamilton, and Jay. Um, that that was very common, and Franklin actually used that as a business strategy. So in the early 1730s, he published a piece that's now called an Apology for Printers in which he outlined uh, a philosophy of a free and open press. And what he meant by that was free from government interference. He didn't want government licensing printers beforehand, only certain, here's the list of printers who were allowed to be in business. And he didn't want government censoring publications after they were published, but open then to the whole community, uh, which is to say, and this gets back to the public sphere to your first question, that the newspaper, he argued, was a public forum, was a public space for people to debate. And the printer's job was not to take a position. For Franklin, though, that's a great political strategy and a business strategy because he has tons of opinions, right? It's Franklin. And so he's able to use that cover uh, to write under pseudonyms, to bring in pieces that he likes, uh, from other people using pseudonyms or, or publishing it anonymously and say, well, free and open press. I'm just running the press. I'm, I'm the guy who sets the type and I'm open to all opinions. It just so happens that they all sound like my writing style and, and agree with what I think. Um, 
so he's he's using that um, very much as a business strategy. Um, what changes during the revolutionary era um, is the the balance of politics and all sorts of things that had been ordinary decisions, which sometimes had political implications in the local context, beginning to have these really broad imperial political com uh, complications and, and connotations, um, whether that's through the post office or with um, going back into the Stamp Act crisis, things like that, where um, your business decisions and your political decisions become very closely intertwined uh, and are watched by others. And so a lot of people are still trying to sort of frame their work as neutral, um, but that's becoming increasingly difficult. And a lot of, of the printers are just increasingly becoming either loyal administration printers or uh, Patriot Son of Liberty printers um, and just really going for it. Which is sort of brings us in, in many ways to to the topic as it pertains to what's going on today, because you know, in some ways, uh, the printer as postmaster in the colonial period is, is sort of the production. Uh, what we're finding, what's happening today, is the sort of the politicization of the of the service of the mail delivery, uh, leveraging that service for certain political ends. Uh, and what we come to find, of course, is that it isn't anything new. Uh, I'm thinking specifically of the, the postal campaign of the 1830s by the abolitionists who mm -hmm. flood the South from the North with uh, anti-slavery tracts. Uh, and that was true in, new, in, in Rhode Island, especially. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to, um, We'll talk about that in a second. I, I'm, I'm uh, looking at a question that has been sent in the uh, Ask a Question uh, box. Uh, Did you know about John Carter, my ancestor, postmaster in Providence? I, I know a little bit about him. Um, he, uh, I, I'm guessing, Angela, that you may actually know more about him than I do um, in, in terms of his specifics, but um, he was a, a, a printer and postmaster in Providence uh, during the Revolutionary Era. He had worked for William Goddard, um, who's somebody who comes up a lot in my work on uh, both on news and on the post office in particular. Um, and then uh, Goddard had an office in Providence in the 1760s that he abandoned for uh, New York and then for Philadelphia. And his mother took the shop over with John Carter, uh, operating it jointly. And then Carter took it over when his mother uh, that is Goddard's mother, Sarah Goddard, retired and, and moved to Philadelphia to be with her son. Um, so, yeah, and then he uh, continued to print the uh, Providence Gazette um, up through the revolution. He was a son of liberty. Um, Angela, you probably could take it further than that, but um, as, a, as a short version, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Bringing it back to today, Joseph, I mean, yeah. um, I, I guess one of the questions that I have is um, the obsession that our pre current president seems to have with the Postal Service and this drive, it seems to me, to privatize it. Uh, and I wonder if you could shed some light. I mean, what is it? I mean, you know, why not? <laughs> I mean, I understand that. Um, I understand that the as a business model, it it it's lacking. Uh, we we know, of course, that it loses money, uh, billions, et cetera, et cetera, and yet, of course, it it functions. But there's an asterisk. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, why don't you shed some light on, on that? I mean, what's going on there? Well, it will come as no surprise uh, to hear a historian say that there's a much longer story than just <laughs> the past few months uh, in terms of politicization and, and ideas about privatization. Um, what's going on is the latest salvo and probably the most successful one in the direction of privatization in a uh, centuries long debate that's gonna take me a book to explain <laughs> um, about the conflict between the idea of the post office as 
a civic institution, as a, a civic part of the government um, structure versus as something that looks like a revenue generating, if not a profit making business. Um, because it is relatively unusual among government services in that it's uh, a fee paid for, it's a service paid for by fees each time you use it. Um, Right. If I want to send a letter, I have to buy a stamp. I have to, or send a package. I have to get the postage. Go to the post office, mail the letter, um, and then it goes. And that's not true for many government services. Um, so, in terms of the way we interact with it, it looks and functions like a business, right? It's most of the post offices now are in storefronts. A lot of them are in, uh, you know, the nearest one to me is in a little strip mall with a hardware store and a pizza shop. Um, you know, when you walk in and you swipe your card and, and buy your stamps or your packages. So it looks like a business. Um, but for a long time, uh, and I would argue was founded this way in the United States, uh, was treated as a, had a very strong civic function that the idea was to create um, the term I use, which I don't think is original to me, but that I use is communications infrastructure that it was designed to be the connective tissue for the nation to communicate. It generated revenue through fees paid for by its users to help support its operations. Absolutely, but it wasn't designed to be a business that operated at a profit. Now, obviously there are people who disagree with me and those people have <laughs> disagreed with that particular take um, for 75, 80 years uh, in terms of a push to try and privatize. And actually the current way the postal system is structured now is far more privatized. Until 1971, it was the US Post Office Department. It was a government uh, department of the federal government. And the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970 uh, reformed it into what is now the US Postal Service, where the federal government is essentially the sole stockholder in a government-owned corporation that operates independent of uh, the federal government. The federal government appoints the board of governors and the postmaster general, but uh, it actually operates on its own revenues. It hasn't taken federal funding since 1971, which is something that's often uh, surprising. And, and I remember I think it was the 2013 shutdown, um, the post office stayed open and people were surprised. And so postal workers started putting up little signs in their post offices of, we don't actually take federal money. Um, so what, what's happened in the last 15 years is there was an act passed in 2006, um, which I'm gonna mangle the name, but it's, it's initials were the, it was the Postal Accountability, and there's an E act. Um, and I apologize for not having all of that right at the ready. Um, but what it essentially required was for the postal system to pre-fund its um, retirement obligations by over 70 years. So my youngest child is three. The post office by law is currently supposed to be paying into a fund for her pension benefits should she grow up and decide to work for the postal system until 60 some odd years from now when she would retire is essentially what the law is requiring. That's when um, the post office was actually, um, they weren't turning a profit every single year, but they were doing okay. Uh, and then you look at the line graph and the line graph just falls off a cliff then um, that there's billions. Um, there have also been then problems with a decline in first class mail. Um, I don't know when the last time you sent a letter was, but it, for me, it's been a while. Uh, I, my family still sends birthday cards, but even but we're getting to be old fashioned in that. Um, it's picked up money in terms of the shift to package deliveries, um, which I think... Um, I think it's not a partisan thing or too partisan thing to say that the, the current president is um, engaged in a variety of battles with the head of Amazon, who is the largest package shipper in the United States. Um, and so that I think is part of what's drawing the president's interests in particular. Um, but the push to privatize is something that's actually going on around the world. Um, Canada Post is privatizing. Uh, Deutsche Post, the German postal system, was sold to DHL a few years ago. Uh, the Royal Mail in the UK is privatizing. Um, so this is something that's happening um, in a lot of European and, and North American nations. That's that's very interesting. I had no idea. Um, 
you know, one forgets, and I was just told this recently, that the U.S. Postal Service is the largest employer in America. It employs more veterans than any other employer. I mean, it's a huge operation. Yeah. So is it is it strictly a function of diminishing mail service? I mean, you know, why does it why does it lose so much money? Uh, you know, what what can they do about it uh, as a business model? And then I want to get to another question by Rich T that I, I want to ask you. Sure. Um, is, it, I mean, the, uh, is it pension dues? I mean, you know, we, we know in Illinois, for example, their, their, their state pension, I mean, they're, they're billions underwater. I mean, you know, that's all over the place, right? So why is it such a sore point with the Postal Service? The big number is the pen. It's Well, it's pre-funding forward in time for people who haven't graduated high school yet. To, to pay pensions is really what it, um, I mean, all sorts of pension systems for public governments around the nation are facing difficulties um, for a whole host of reasons. And those same reasons are applying to the Postal Service in terms of um, aging workforce, declining birth rate, which means that the as the boomers retire in large numbers, they're replaced by smaller numbers of workers. Um, right, so there's all sorts of these structural factors that are affecting everybody, but the really big ticket is the pensions and the pre is the pre-funding piece of the pensions. Um, it's also, that's obscuring then the other part of the story that is happening, right? There is a decline in mail. People don't subscribe to as many magazines. People don't send as many letters or cards as they used to. Um, package shipping is making up for that. Um, but not much, but the, the pre-funding of pensions is really overtaking that. Um, Joseph, thank you. Uh, someone has just uh, written, and Alden Pruti has uh, written, what was the purpose of the pre-funding pensions? Was that mother load of money divertible to other arms of government? So uh, the easier part to answer is that it was not money that was divertible to other parts of the government because it's all money from within the Postal Service. Um, it's all in, on the Postal Service's account books um, that this is happening. They are borrowing money um, to make up some of those obligations. Um, so in that sense, the asterisk one is that they're not, they don't take federal funding, but the asterisk two is they are borrowing money from the federal government to make up for these debts that they're um, required by law to take on. Um, the officially announced purpose was um, to ensure security for the pension system. Um, the suspicion was that it was the it was promoted by people who are interested in privatizing the postal system, um, and so there's an argument by critics of this act that it was uh, essentially an act of intentional sabotage. That it was to try to um, break the system as a government agency to be able to then sell it and split it off and fully privatize it. You know, all of this reminds me of uh, we, if it w were to be privatized, of course, it'd return us exactly to people controlling the mail who are uh, who might have political leanings that they could, um, you know, leverage by way of the Postal Service since they're controlling the mail. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so in many ways, it becomes a political issue of a, a sort of democratic um you know, public service uh, against those who would privatize and possibly inflect it politically. Uh, Rich T has uh, I, is asking, how does a private organization enforce federal laws, like for search warrants, mail fraud, et cetera? Um, I mean, the, the Postal Service is doing that now as a sort of semi-private. Um, I mean, the short version, um, I haven't seen recently any of a full privatization bill um, that would be in Congress. My guess is that, at least at the beginning, um, I mean, it would depend on what the federal law says. So the short answer is it, it might not, because <laughs> uh, it would be based on an act that hasn't been passed yet. Um, my suspicion is that a private corporation would still have to meet certain uh, bounds of federal law. Um, there is interest across the political spectrum in information privacy and protecting that. And that is something that, um, you know, the 
postal service uh, without a search warrant is not allowed to open your mail. Um, there are, there's actually quite a lot that they can find out just from looking at the outside of it. <laughs> um, the, uh, the metadata of what you put on the envelope, um, right? If the second week of May you send a card shaped envelope that's pink and address it to a woman with the same name as the person on the return address label, it's probably a good guess that that's a Mother's Day card to your mother, <laughs> um, right? Just to give you a really easy example so I can find out where, uh, right? If I, somebody, if a mailman drops that on the street, I know who your mother is and where she lives. <laughs> um, because if you're putting a card in a pink envelope the second week of May, um, you know, so there's lots of information that people can get just from looking at the outside, but they're not allowed to open by law, open the mail. Um, one hopes that should privatization take place that the bipartisan interest in protecting information would create a circumstance where said private corporation who was would essentially be contracted out to do um, security would, would maintain that, but it, it depends on how the law would be written. So if privatization becomes a real hot button and it looks like it's going through Congress and that's something that interests you, call your congresswoman or, or congressman and <laughs> make a point of making it a priority. I guess my question as a business model, what would a private company do differently than the current postal service to make it a viable business that isn't losing billions? I mean, is it cutting the workforce, uh, efficiency of delivery or what? I mean, what? Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the um, one of the big cost factors for the post office right now is that it operates under law with a universal service obligation. It is required to serve every zip code in the United States, and along the East Coast, um, right, we're piled in pretty thick. The post office turns a profit in the Northeast, the, sa the same way that Amtrak loses money overall, but it makes money on the Acela corridor. Um, between Boston and DC. But in Nevada, for example, there's a zip code that is the size of Maryland. And the Postal Service is required to deliver to addresses in that zip code, however many thousands of square miles big that is. Um, if I put something in the mail to rural Alaska, I pay, um, I think it's 55 cents. Now that we've gone to forever stamps, I've lost track of what a, a first class stamp costs. Right. If I send something to you in Newport, I pay put a 55 cent stamp on it. If I'm sending something to Nome, Alaska, I put a 55 cent stamp on it. If I'm sending something to Honolulu, I put a 55 cent stamp on it from Massachusetts. Um, I'm paying the exact same amount. And the costs involved are quite different to get to those places. Um, so I think the one of the fears of people who oppose privatization would be either reduced service in rural areas and or um, perhaps in combination, raised rates, um, right, in the way that, um, right, UPS and, and FedEx are able to charge differential rates for, for service, uh, that if the Postal Service were allowed to do that. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why, um, you know, FedEx and UPS aren't necessarily excited about Postal Service privatization, not just because of the competition, um, but because yeah, they take off. advantage of the universal service obligation. They, the... Uh, Post office provides last mile service uh, for FedEx and UPS and Amazon deliveries in rural areas where it's just not cost effective to do the delivery for those private services. And so they subcontract out for the last mile for to, to USPS. For pennies on the dollar, I mean, for, for much cheaper than what it would cost them. Uh, David yes. Trump has a very good question. Um, the Constitution established the U.S. Post Office Department, the only administrative department of government established by the Constitution. Why was the post office so important to the founders? Did they want the post office to protect the communications of U.S. citizens and defend the right and liberties of citizens? There's a lot in that question, but I love it when somebody brings up the Constitution. So yes, the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, among the powers of Congress is to establish post offices and post roads. Um, and obviously that indicates the seriousness with which they took the post office. Um, I also point to, um, in 1775, when the Continental Congress, second Continental Congress started meeting, one of the very first things they did was establish a post office. So, uh, that then turns into what's now the U S post office. So the post office in the United States is the third oldest institution of the United States. Older, the only things that are older are Congress and the army. 
but they've created the post office before they created a Navy. They created a post office a year before declaring independence. So um, facilitating communication is really, really important um, to the founders. And it, it wasn't, I don't know if I'd quite use the terminology of protecting rights and liberties, but it was about um, politics and public information was the, in very broad stroke terms um, at the sort of intro 100 level survey um, version of founding political philosophy um, was the idea of an informed citizenry and an active participating citizenry. Now for them, that meant white men almost entirely. Um, so it, they, they have a more limited view of that than we do. Um, but they wanted that group of white men to be informed and active citizens, that that was the way to protect against the encroachment of corruption and tyranny. And to be able to do that, you have to know what's going on. Um, sorry, go ahead and jump in. And no, no, which is exactly the, the founding premise of the Redwood Library itself, of course, is that uh, an educated citizenry undergirds the Republic. And so uh, it makes perfect sense. Uh, we have a question from uh, Karen. Uh, and this has to do, uh, again, uh, with the 18th century context. How did a recipient know to visit the post office to collect their mail? Uh, did everyone just make a point of stopping by monthly or weekly? It's true. When I think about the account book of Thomas Vernon at, in Providence, you have the whole list of names, including Redwood himself. How did Redwood know that there was a letter waiting for him? He would just drop in now and again? or? Um. So a, a couple of ways. One is not everybody picked up their letters. Um, so there was that problem. Um, but a, as I said earlier, the people using the postal system most frequently um, were something closer to power users. They were merchants and businessmen and government officials. Um, and so they were regularly moving about town um, and would know the post rider arrives in Newport on Thursday. And so on Thursdays, I'll stop by the postmaster's office and, and see if there's anything for me. Um, you know, so there is definitely that of people who know to stop by. Um, I don't have direct evidence of this, but I wouldn't be surprised since um, the postmaster was almost always also something else, whether it was a printer or a shopkeeper or something else that he would have had uh, employees, apprentices, right? The teenagers who were training to be part of that trade. Um, they wouldn't deliver the letter usually because postage has to be paid, but um, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if there was an apprentice uh, in charge of going around town, especially to people who were prominent and, and had a considerable volume of mail uh, for somebody to re you know report to their door and say, by the way, you got 15 letters today. Um, so that happens. And then there's a, uh, for those who don't, the newspapers become a public a mechanism of publicizing um, that there'll be, the post office will advertise at various intervals uh, every month or two, depending on, on what's going on and, and how many people haven't picked up of, you know, list of list of people who have things waiting for them. And just then an alphabetical list by last name of everybody who's got a letter waiting. Since the recipient paid, I mean, did it ever happen? You know, if I got a letter that I wasn't expecting and they were like, oh, by the way, it's, you know, 10 sheets and you owe a fortune, you might say, no, I don't want it. Um, That's true. I mean, it reminds me of, you know, portrait painters sometimes. People would arrive at the portrait studio and say, you know what, that likeness is, is weak. It doesn't look anything like me. I'm not paying. Um, are there examples of that? I mean. All the time. And it's one of the problems. I mean, it's a, it, the post office is taking on a risk by transporting something without having been paid first. Uh, and I don't know the exact percentage. Um, the Vernon account book, um, there's a scholar at, at BC named Christy Potroff who's been working with the Vernon account book. Um, and so she, if she can't already, may soon um, be able to give some information about what rate, uh, at what rate people don't bother to pick up their letters. Um, but in Franklin's correspondence as deputy postmaster general, that's one of the big financial problems that he's trying to solve is the expense of transporting things that don't actually get picked up. Um, they don't get as far as prepayment. Uh, that doesn't come into play until the 1840s. Um, but they they work to try to find ways to find people, to track people down. Um, it actually ends up becoming um, 
it ends up becoming by the 1830s and 40s in the era just before postage stamps and prepayment becomes common, um, a way of people for people living at long distances to communicate uh, without spending money. Um, and there's some evidence, there's a historian named David Henkin who wrote a book about the 19th century post office. Uh, and in his research, he shows that uh, 49ers, people who are now for the gold rush, um, would do things like send a very short note that wouldn't be paid for. But all the, the family wanted to know was that they were they didn't have any money, so they couldn't afford to pay for the postage. But then they'd know that the person arrived safely. Um, or newspapers were charged a much cheaper rate than letters. So the person would send a newspaper from San Francisco back to, um, you know, back to Providence or back to Framingham or wherever. And, you know, would circle like a, a, a rebus or a, um, not an acronym, um, acrostic. Um, A-I-S-F-S arrived in San Francisco safely and just circle letters going down the page um, or just write a note inside the newspaper. So uh, even after the revolution, I was talking about informal systems, people were trying to sneak their way to, to cheaper rates within the postal system and the postal rates um, up through into the 1840s, which gets us pretty far away from people not picking up their letters, but. Um, well, it just reminds me of this, this constant push to exploit this public service. It's like Amazon counting on the on the postal service to deliver all these packages for much cheaper than what it would cost them. Uh, we have a question by Alan. Uh, it's surprising to hear that countries with such seemingly different ideas about government are all moving to privatize their post offices at around the same time. Are the arguments for privatization similar across countries? Uh, the short answer is yes, <laughs> they are. Um, so, I mean, the, these kinds of arguments, um, so Reaganite conservatism and Thatcherite conservatism and, and privatizing government agencies. Um, so this is not, this is also not a new phenomenon in terms of thinking about transnational ideas about um, what are proper government functions and what should be privatized. Um, and then within the local, local meaning national political context, it's a question of um, political will and funding and circumstances and, and organizing a coalition to do it in a way that um, that that can pass through whatever uh, legislative act needs to get done. And that I don't proclaim to be an expert on the German or the French or the British post office by any stretch. So um, I wouldn't want to go further than saying that. But the, the ideas are certainly transnational uh, about what should be proper government functions and what should be privatized. Uh, Rich T. Uh, with uh, another question. It seems that the USPS underwrites the costs of the Republic, census, tax returns, Medicare, civil service. How might this affect the political system, which goes back again to uh, if it was privatized, you'd have private citizens impinging on what we feel is a sort of public service. Yeah, well, and... Um I'm not sure how much of that question. I mean, people receive Medicare, not Medicare checks, but file for Medicare, so receive social security checks. Um, I mean, to the extent it, it seems like everybody is doing direct deposit and e-pay on everything, but that's actually not the case. Um, and so there are a lot of people. Uh, and one thing that's that there's been some reporting on in contemporary politics is for a lot of rural places, the post office is still functioning as a, a public sphere, physical space for people. It's a gathering space in a community uh, where people come together and they're worried about losing that. Um, so it, it privatizing it would, losing it altogether would be catastrophic <laughs> uh, in terms of, of the, it, this again, it, it feels like all we get is junk mail, but there actually is quite a lot of, um, of service provided, not just in terms of Amazon package, but in terms of right medication, social security, Medicare, um, census forms, all sorts of things that that not everybody is as online as it sometimes seems to people who are very online. Um, and privatizing it, I mean, this is one of the challenges of what it would look like is it would require a set of negotiations then between the government and a private company, which it does for a whole host of things, um, to set rates, to determine delivery practices, all sorts of things uh, that it would open up. 
Okay, Joseph, we've hit the one hour mark. I think we can uh, draw a line here. Um, Fair enough. I, I, I want to thank you very much for kindly agreeing to take part in this discussion. This is a bit of a new format for us. Uh, historically, we've had people lecture and, and everyone listening. Uh, so this has been really good to be able to uh, discuss and, and take people's questions. Uh, for everyone watching, um, if you're not a member of the Redwood, by all means. <laughs> uh, if uh, you, you might want to uh, also uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. So that's very important as well. It, it elevated Thomas Vernon's social status. So we can <laughs> exactly. do that for you too. <laughs> exactly. You know, we'll send you, uh, Joseph, we'll, we want to help elevate your social status as well. So you'll get a, uh, uh, a gift membership to the Redwood Library. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, uh, now, I, I want to just mention, um, First of all, I want to thank Joseph Adelman, uh, Edelman, excuse me, for participating, and it was uh, a very enlightening talk uh, about an important issue. And we'll see how it all. Hopefully, we'll get through it without a big trauma, uh, God willing. Uh, next week, uh, we are going to hear from author Ted Widmer, Widmer uh, about his award-winning book *Lincoln on the Verge*. Uh, he is distinguished lecturer at Macaulay uh, Honors College, CUNY. Uh, in addition to his teaching, he writes actively about American history in the New York Times, the New Yorker, and the Washington Post. Uh, he grew up in Rhode Island and, uh, like Mr. Edelman, also attended Harvard University. So, uh, next week, Lincoln. Uh, after that will be our, our favorite. Uh, well, we like them all, but we especially like uh, Dr. Marquard, uh, who will be uh, doing one of his series on classical music. Uh, but in any case, uh, I want to thank our speaker again uh, this evening, uh, Professor Edelman of Framingham State University. I want to thank all of you who have watched this evening and asked those brilliant questions. And uh, by all means, come visit at the Redwood Library in Newport, Rhode Island anytime. So thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you all so much.